Uh, just to make you aware, I think you're all aware of the fire procedure, but just there are no planned fire drills, although there was one earlier. Do leave by the nearest escape route, which is the stairs at the back to the left and down to the bottom of the building across the inner car park. Do not use the lift and no heavy petting. So we've got fairly full agenda tonight. So just remind a few points uh, before I go on to the timings and start with the agenda. Just a uh, reminder of the last meeting, I think it's important to realise that it isn't the committee's job to chastise uh, individual officers. That remains the sole responsibility of the chief executive. So if you have any uh, issues with officers, please take it up with um, Wendy. And also to remind everybody that all these committee meetings, especially corporate scrutiny, are non-political. So we can keep this focused on the questions rather than the politics. So we have got, as I say, a full agenda. So we'll get through the minutes, declarations of interest, and we have no public questions. We'll get through that in the first three or four minutes. The progress update, uh, there may well be some questions. I'll allow five minutes. Item five, committee's work plan, 15 minutes for points A and B, because you may want to add some things in point B, because there's some gaps in there. Point six, quarter performance. Uh, we'll go. We'll aim at 20 minutes and see how we get on, because it is important that we do have a chance to cross-examine the information we've got. And the big one, 0.7, will go at 45 minutes. Don't feel you have to fill that time. It's not a performance, uh, but I do think it's important we get a chance to ask any questions. Then we have, as ever, members' questions at the end. So is everyone happy for me to sign the minutes as a true record of the last meeting? A proposer? Yeah, seconded. Yeah, thank you very much. There we go. Any declarations of interest on today's agenda? OK, smashing. No public questions. Progress update. Hope you've all had a chance to look at the progress update. It just actually ends at uh, today's meeting, which is good. I think it shows that we've actually made some progress. Anybody got any questions or points they want to raise on the progress update? Or anything they're concerned about that's on there that doesn't seem to be in progress? Councillor Payne. Um, just under outstanding actions, I was wondering if there's an update on the floating bridge mediation process. Obviously, it's been deferred since January. Um, didn't know if there's an update for us on this, or if it's a matter of still waiting for the mediation process um, as that's underway. And is there a date for me expect this to end in the next stage we can? Good question. I don't know who they could answer that. Wendy, I don't know. Do you want me to take that chair? I'm, I'm happy to respond. Um, it is an ongoing mediation process, so as yet there's no final decision on the outcome of that. Um, I'm not aware that there is a cut-off date by which that mediation will um, end, but I can certainly provide more details in terms of how likely it is to go forward. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Spink. Um, it's page 12 of the bundle, 10th of May. Uh, clarification be sought from the Cabinet Member for Planning and Community Engagement as to when meetings of the Corporate Scrutiny Committee, Cabinet and Full Council would be required to consider the island planning strategy. And a request be made that the report be made available to the Committee a month in advance of the Cabinet meeting. Information requested from Councillor Fuller on the 11th of May and the date to be confirmed. I, I asked if I know Councillor Fuller's here, but I don't know if um, the uh, Chief Executive, uh, Mr. Pereira, is able to help. But I have heard it rumoured that the draft plan is coming back before Cabinet and corporate scrutiny in July. And if so, it should be being served on um, us round about now, according to, according to that request. Through you again, Chair, please. Um, my understanding is, and it's in the forward plan that has recently been published, that the island planning strategy is coming to Cabinet in September oh. and on to full council, and it will be coming to scrutiny in July. So you will be getting it at next scrutiny meeting in draft, which will be a full nearly two months before it then goes to Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you. It's not moves us on to 5B, Committee's Work Programme, which uh, all I was going to say is that we are going to make uh, 12th of July mainly about uh, the island plan 
and then we will have the opportunity because we've got a gap on the 8th of September to pick up anything that may or may not change by that point. So we should have this time around, <laughs> we should have this time around quite a lot of time to, to scrutinise it. Anything else to add on work programme? Smash it. Well, that leads us nicely on to item six, quarterly performance monitoring, which uh, thank you for uh, Sorry, Chair, I just had a question on 5A. Yeah. Um, obviously, you skipped straight to 5B, sorry. Um, so, in relation to the parking that is in uh, the plan, obviously the site that is supposed to have parking within East Cows is also part of the regeneration um, part of the Homes England agreement. So, I was just wondering if this could be confirmed as the temporary measure until the Homes England agreement is fulfilled and housing is put onto that site. Um, and if we can get some reassurances that um, the council tenants, Rapa Nui and White Shipyard based in East Cows will get um, parking within the town. Thank you for being that car park. Sorry. Who'd like to take that one? Chris. Chris Ashman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor, for the for the reason the point. Uh, I can confirm, yeah, there is a temporary arrangement. Um, there is a, uh, a a scoping study for the waterfront of East Cows which identifies that, that site as a potential residential site. Um, our commitments to Homes England are to achieve a planning permission on that site by next uh, next March. Um, so in that case, we can expect that provision to be in place for approximately two years until the commencement of that, that project gets underway, given the challenges obviously we have on, on affordable housing. Um, the second point really is a uh, relation to the the business that you referred to, um, the company clearly has its own responsibilities regarding provide provision of available transport for its um, its employees. We have sought to advise the company on uh, a system of travel plan, for example, so that those uh, who may be used to travelling by car at the moment are made aware of other routes of getting to work. The employees at that factory are obviously not mobile employees. They actually stay in that factory for the whole of the day and therefore leave, leave their car to be left to that particular area. Um, I won't go into the terms of the commercial discussions we had with the company on acquiring their, their building, um, but so, suffice to say that the company uh, wasn't in a position to offer their employees continuing guaranteed parking, um, wasn't prepared to support that. We do have other users of that car park who uh, have these terms agreements with us. Um, but unfortunately, um, the shipbuilding company doesn't. So it really is unfortunately going to be a position where um, those employees are going to have to find their own arrangements uh, or pay to use the car park um, as any other resident may need to do. Um, as part of the scoping study, there is a piece of work underway looking at transport issues in these towns as a whole. And part of that clearly is to look at parking in more depth across the town and identify link to the scoping study uh, appropriate uses and available uh, sources of that. I think we can do our best to work, continue to work with the company and their employees to advise them on available nearby parking because what we don't want to happen, of course, is impacts on residential streets, which um, clearly will be a concern for some of the, the board members in this room. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Councillor Lee. Um, I apologise, Chair. Um, I'm a bit slow in your movement. I've got one or two points I, I wanted to bring up the forward plan, um, particularly linked with the cabinet, the um, cabinet meeting that this scrutiny aligns with uh, on the 16th of June. I just wanted to clarify one or two things. Um, one, one was, is it possible, Chair, that when we talk about the provision of affordable housing, we could also make reference to the other housing document which is going to Cabinet, which is about homelessness and rough uh, sleeping strategy, which is on page three, forward plan and within the Cabinet papers, because actually the two things go together. They, they relate and, and definitely I would like to ask some questions across both. That, that's for today. So you want to make? You, yeah. So yeah. I, do, I just by think that means. strategy is in the cabinet. Yeah, no, by that, all that housing strategy, and they do relate. And right? Anything in your pack is free game. Yeah, <laughs> right. The the other um, particular one was 
the public health, um, which has got down for the 14th of, of July, right, uh, on page seven, um, it did go to, there was discussion at health scrutiny, and one of the things that was agreed at health scrutiny, which was also agreed by the Director of Public Health and Councillor for Love and Adult Social Care was that there was going to be an LGA peer review um, regarding um, an, an independent report regarding that. So is the 14th of July realistic that it will come back to Cabinet? Hmm? That's on the Cabinet agenda for the 8th of September now. Is it moved to the 8th of September? It has moved, so it's not. OK, that's out of date then. The uh, 16th of July is out of date. Then. Yeah, OK. Chair, yeah, could I possibly just ask as well on the um, on the work plan um, arising out of my question? Um, which meeting of corporate scrutiny will the um, draft plan come before? Will it be the September meeting? It'd be the 12th of July. And then if there is any changes again in September, so we're going to give ourselves two opportunities. OK, thank you. Based on the fact that last time it was unsatisfactory, I think for quite a lot of members, you only had a right, yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else around items 5A and 5B? You bet, last, it's better be good, Cam. One last one. <laughs> on uh, levelling up to the second bid, obviously the council putting in, um, what is the, you know, how long is the process going to be from us putting in the bid? Um, to finding out the outcome. Obviously, it's been very successful in East Cows, and we've seen that. Um, do the council have adequate staff? Obviously, there's a lot of projects being run at the moment, and this is you know, a particularly large one, uh, 14 million, if I remember rightly. Um, and you know, what, what will the process be from finding out if we've got it um, from putting in that bid? Ms. Ashman. Thank you, Chair. And again, thank you for the question. Um, Councillor makes a really good point uh, regarding capacity, in particular in the investment that has to go into preparing these competitive applications for government funding. I think we always have to recognise that uh, the funding solutions that are available to the government publish have to be seriously considered as a route to achieving our objectives of regeneration on the island. So we must consider both the opportunity that that presents, but also the risks associated with it. In this particular case where the next round of levelling up funding has been announced and it didn't, is required, you'll see from the cabinet papers we're currently working on a, an application. The actual way in which the round for second round for levelling up funding is constructed requires us to submit only a transport related application because we were successful under the first round and the regeneration. So and under in MP allocations for projects, uh, we are only able now to submit the transport element, which is excellent because we have a really exciting project uh, which links together activity which various project managers have worked on for some time, i.e. the West White Greenway, uh, the public improvements in and around right, around uh, local transport improvement plans, all of those things, all of that effort has gone into making a potential for an island greenway uh, a very real prospect. And I think in terms of the government's agenda of trying to encourage not just obviously the levelling up of communities but their sustainable development um, we feel that that bid will be competitive in terms of it being successful uh, the usual round uh, is that we have to submit the bid in july in june sorry 8th of july um, and then the uh, assessments go on over the summer and we usually have an indication of whether we are successful in by the end of october um, if we are successful then clearly we have to take a view in relation to commitments that we have currently uh, those staff on implementation of transport related projects, then obviously we will want to deliver that project. So we will have to make some difficult decisions from when we were successful. The other thing I will say to the committee obviously is these funds are highly competitive. Um, and whilst we were successful in the round one, there's obviously no guarantee that we'll be successful this time around as well. But it doesn't stop us from obviously trying. Actually, does that answer your question, Cameron? Councillor Quirk before Michael puts his hand up again. Uh, just a really quick one. In terms of the uh, island plan coming to scrutiny, I wanted to have a clear month to scrutinise it. Um, whilst it's good to have it on the July agenda, I think we have to have our main consideration of it on the September agenda 
when we've actually had time to really delve into it and ask questions. Yeah, that's a fair point. Absolutely. I just want just wanted to add um, a supplementary question on um, Cameron's one. Um, because the levelling up bid is very much about cycling, right? Uh, and the, the greenways and etc. How much advantage do we do we, we get some added value, the fact of the link to the UK um, tour, you know, tour, tour de Britain and cycling um, with that? Because it seems to me quite a nice add, added advantage that this year we have that, and that obviously is about cycling. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I'll take away, Chair, to include in the narrative for the bid. Thank you. OK, I'm ready to move on. Excellent, no dissenters. Fantastic. So uh, item six, quarterly performance. Uh, quite a lot of information there. Thank you for citing advance. That's really helpful. Who is taking us through the quarterly performance? Please do, Councillor John. Uh, it, it's up to you. Uh, exception reporting might be good and then take questions, but however you feel fit. I'll take any questions as we go through each section of it. Um, uh, just to pull out a few individual figures on the top of page 30 on the documents, uh, you'll see, and, and I have to say some of these I'm pulling out because they're of a personal interest to me, uh, something I take great note of. Uh, you'll see the figures we've got here for the number of households in temporary accommodation. I think that's always a, a benchmark of our performance as a council and particularly uh, the moral and financial combination that we have to deal with on the island. Um, you see the figures for March this year are very much the same as last year. Of course, we would always like them to be going down, but given all the ancillary pressures that we know households have been facing, uh, I think it's uh, quite remarkable that it has remained the same, though, of course, we continue to pay great attention to it. On page 32, <clears throat> we talk here about, in the middle of the page, the draft financial accounts are due to be completed this year in July. Um, uh, you'll see there are other references in here as well to the completion of those. We have an issue with our auditors, which we're already aware of, and it's worth bringing up here, that their availability to start the auditing of our accounts is not until after the due date of those accounts later this year in September. So we are going to be late with the filing of those, in common, I believe, with most of the local authorities or many local authorities within the UK. It's simply down to a their availability, which is holding us back on that, and uh, no other adverse issues at all. And then the final thing is to say that we do want to move on, hopefully to when I've concluded going through the sections here, uh, with approving uh, this report as it's presented. So if I come on to uh, the first one, which is Appendix 1, dealing with strategic partnerships in the COVID recovery, um, I don't have any particular areas to bring out there, although uh, we do continue to get quite a lot of comment uh, about the annual funding settlement of one million. Um, it, it was a very low figure and of course there are efforts underway to uh, have those discussions forwarded for with government ministers for the next round. We do hope that that situation improves. Um, I'm happy to take any questions on Appendix 1 if there are any. Councillor Lee and Councillor Cork. <clears throat> You just, uh, I mean, thank you, Councillor Jolman. The particular issue about the island deal, um, in the in the light of recent re renovation, renovation uh, regarding the island deal, I'm curious, what is Isle of Wight Council's position in getting this back on track? Because obviously there was a lot of negative publicity about this. Um, and I'm just concerned what is Isle of Wight Council's policy strategy? You know, what are we doing as a council to actually get that island deal, which is pivotal? And I, uh, within that goes back to the university, you know, the University of Portsmouth report and that deficit. And the more things go, time goes on, that deficit is getting bigger. Uh, within that and particularly, you know, issues of of uh, our transport problems, 
etc of huge increase in um, or is it a reduction in rental accommodation, all those, those things, the island deal is even more critical. So I want to know what is the Isle of Wight Council strategy, not others' strategy, in getting our voice properly and soundly heard uh, at government. So I'm going to hand over to Wendy in a minute, but uh, just from my perspective, to give by way of an introduction to this, we we need to have that dialogue at the highest level in government to have any chance of success with it. And there have been continuing discussions going on with our MP and with his assistants uh, up to government ministers. Uh, we have had a track record, I have to say, for many years of achieving zero on this. So the fact that we did get any at all breaks that particular glass ceiling, which is a good start to it. But there have been continuing discussions and the route is very much through our MP uh, to use that lobbying. We're all familiar with the studies that have been done, including the most recent study, uh, which show that differential, a very sizable differential, I would argue, that the count that the Isle of Wight suffers as a result of its, um, or enjoys in some ways, you could say, as a result of its separation from the North Island. Um, we are at a disadvantage and it plays out in a number of ways. And we've made that case, I think, very solidly for a number of years. It's not just the issue of the sea that divides us. It's not simply a question of that stretch of water not being an estuary, but really being part of the sea. It's not just the fact that there's a cost of transport to the island and the fact that goods cost more here and that there are, there's limited competition on the island. It's all of the above, which is part of that story. And we have to continue making that story with the, with the utmost vigour to those government ministers. Wendy, do you want to add something to that, I'm sure? If I might, Chair. Thank you. Um, I, I think you've very nicely sort of set out in summary what our approach is. We continue to make the point to government and to government ministers that we feel we have made the case for the island to be properly considered in the fair funding review um, in terms of our area cost adjustment. In addition to that, we continue to push, push the case that in the lack of the fair funding review coming forward, we we require additional funding over and above what may come out of the Fair Funding Review, which of course has been delayed again further. So our conversations happen at government department level, but they are also happening at ministerial level as well. And we continue to make the point that we feel we have made the case. If government um, then asks us further questions about the case that we have put forward, we, we are continually responding to those points, reinforcing why we think we've made the case for the island. That's what we continue to do at the moment and will continue to do quite forcefully over the next few months as well. And I think to further amplify that, we are at a bit of a loss as to what other information they need from us. You know, we have jumped through all the hoops over quite a long period of time. We have provided the case, we've provided independent analysis. Uh, which reinforces earlier independent analysis. There's a consistent theme which comes out from that. Uh, so we've done everything that's been asked of us. And the question is, what further is that they require to recognise that differential? Um, and that's where we need to get to. Answer the question. Uh, page 46, the middle of the page, uh, we've got the successful completion of alcohol treatments. Uh, this has dropped from 38%, which I thought was pretty poor to start off with, down to 28%, which is a lot worse. Um, in the text, it says this is because we've got more people coming in, but that suggests that maybe we haven't got the resource to deal with the people coming in, the fact that we are going down. Um, I'd like to know what we're doing about it more than anything. and. What are the hidden outcomes? I mean, uh, alcohol was involved in the uh, murder in Shankin. Is that the outcome that we're hiding? <laughs> so I, I was going through the appendices one by one. I'm, I'm still on appendix one at the moment. Um, can, we, can we hold that if you don't mind? Yeah, by all means, if we, yeah. if, we, if we hold that question, so don't let, don't let you move on, Councillor okay. Quirk, without answering. But if we... My other question uh, is that the call centre performance. Um, when I call, if I know the phone number is essential to get through to, I'm in through in 15, 20 seconds. Uh, if I don't and I have to go see the operator, uh, I think it's probably an average of five minutes. What are we actually measuring here? Are we including all calls, including those that go through immediately, as bringing down the average? Because I think the important point is when someone phones the council, 
and they don't know who they need to speak to and they have to go through the operator. How long does that take? And that's a, a more relevant number than the average numbers. If you, if you come to that one as well, you? Yeah, at least we know Council Quirk's read every single page. You no, yes. no doubt. So Thank you, I, I, no, no, I, yeah. I admire his diligence here. Yeah. So, um, if, we, so if, if we can answer those as we come to them, that'd be great. Okay. Were, were there any other questions on Appendix One? No. Okay. So coming on to Appendix Two, um, we've made note here just to highlight something is the QR codes that we put for accessibility uh, on the entrance to the building. Um, I, I bring this forward because I think it's a it's a real achievement that we've done and we've recognised this, and so that you know people with uh, disabilities of various sorts when they approach the building can scan that code and can actually understand what the purpose of that particular entrance to the building is. And I know for many of us who are fully able-bodied, uh, that might seem a very small thing. But for those who are challenged in terms of accessibility, I think it's a very valuable tool that we've recognised and, and added to our building. Uh, also to pull out uh, within page uh, 38 of this section, you'll see that we are looking here at an underspend going forwards at the moment. These things, of course, are early in the financial year of about 1.3 million. And then on the next page, uh, you'll see that we have uh, a shortfall in terms of gross income, which is currently predicted around 3.2. Uh, and we, we pull out some of the analysis about that, where it's coming from. Obviously, some of it is because of the parking measures, which have not been fully introduced or others which have been introduced which promote other aspects on the island for example the free parking for an hour in Newport and Carisbrook which I think has been a great success from all I've seen so far and of course we continue to suffer from the reduced amount of income from the leisure sector on the island uh, we've noticed the bounce back from that and the numbers has not been particularly rigorous there are of course other competitors within the health sector and the gyms etc which uh, are competing with us for that traffic. Uh, on the next, but one page 41, uh, you'll see that we've, uh, we're showing a downfall in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the business rates. And of course, much of that is due to the relief which has been provided during the ongoing pandemic issue. And then finally, uh, just to note that we've already revised the bottom of page 41 in the cabinet papers. Uh, some of you will may not have read through all the cabinet papers, although I'm sure Chris has been very vigorous on these things already. Um, and we've taken a couple of changes. One is that on some of the charts, as we go through these figures, you'll find that we're quoting figures which are inherently quite out of date. They're about, they, they end with 2019. And the reason for that is because the figures were not produced during the COVID period at all. But that does, of course, present rather a false flag for the information and it's been out of date and others we're going to correct going forward to relate to some of the indices that you'll see on the left hand side where you might find that uh, there's actually a numerical change of perhaps 12 but it's presented on a scale that runs from uh, the, no the, me the median of that minus five to the top of that plus five and it gives a very distorted uh, impact of that change and 12 for example on some of the metrics can be a very small change but it looks as though it's amplified simply because of the scales. Uh, on the debt figures, if I can call your attention to those, you'll find out that at um, the beginning of the year, we had a, um, uh, a forecast in terms of our uh, borrowing, which was expressed in different terms. And the, uh, the gross figure was some 409 million as a total financing requirement. And rather than showing all the figures individually and here simply as debt, what we've done is broken down what we mean by debt. So whether it's a finance requirement, whether it's actually debt or whether it's actually a borrowing figure. And those figures in the cabinet papers are now expressed, I think, with much greater clarity so that we can track each of them with more accuracy going forwards. They all have a different meaning, but it's important that we understand the different meanings and that we can track them comparing apples with apples rather than apples with pears. So hopefully a, a, a degree more rigor being introduced to those figures going forwards. Just to see, therefore, if there are any questions on Appendix 2. Uh, yeah, Councillor Clerk's question about the uh, average time to answer calls. Yes. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm very happy if we want to go over to Sharon, who's over in the corner, dressed in the uh, flag colours of the Ukrainian flag. I know it's there with, uh, <laughs> blue sash and yeah. So just to explain how we calculate the contact centre stats, we have 30 
plus called silver lines going into the contact centre and we monitor each line individually. So, for example, building control, housing benefit, council tax, each has a silver line and we look at that in that performance individually. And then we add them all up together and out of that we calculate the average. So the average of, say, 41 uh, seconds is across the whole board. Mm -hmm. But we are what we are keen to do is analyse each line. And there are obviously lines that take a little bit longer to, to uh, respond to. Um, and therefore, we feed back that performance to the contact centre manager and to the um, advisors, and we work to understand what this, the, to analyse what the calls are, to understand why people are calling us, and to try and respond to that you know, quicker. In response to your question around whether some of this was automated, this is not automated, um, but we do also have a performance stat where we're looking to respond to um, queries answered in person. And also those that are, which are uh, responded to and resolved at the first point of contact. To answer your question, Councillor Cook. Uh, yes, it answers the question, but it might be interesting to see those other figures. Yeah, absolutely, no problem. We we get stats every every month that splits down the individual performance of each line. So very happy to share that. Thank you, Sean. That's John. Uh, so moving on to Appendix 3, which is uh, Social Care and Public Health, I'm going to hand over to Councillor Levin and see if he wants to add anything to it. But just to pull out a couple of the figures, uh, you'll see on page 45, uh, and I'm really doing this to extend the information which is here and to give you some indication of how we're continuing to modify the information that's being presented to make it clearer going forwards. Um, you'll see here we have some figures on smoking cessation which are presented. Uh, we've had some discussion about the figures and one of the complications here is what do we really mean by the term smoking? And so rather than simply leaving it as a single term, we've asked for the figures to be presented in terms of uh, the cessation of cigarette smoking and the transition of people through vaping and, and other mechanisms into being completely nicotine free, which at the end of the day is the goal. So knowing that people have stopped cigarette smoking is of some use knowing that they've completely stopped using that particular drug and are nicotine free uh, going forwards is, is, a, is an additional health benefit that we want to pursue on that one. And then finally, some conversation that came up earlier um, today about the, the health statistics for the island in general, which are on pages 48 and 49. The question was asked, why is the life expectancy falling on the Isle of Wight? And you'll see that the, the period in which uh, life expectancy appears to have fallen on the Isle of Wight as a projection <clears throat> is classically during the COVID period. And of course, because we have a particularly aged population um, and we're a relatively sm smaller cohort, the impact of that information was necessarily greater than it might otherwise have been within the general population. And of course, it did affect the elder population um, uh, more profusely. So I'll pass on to Councillor Levin, see if he wanted to add anything to this section. Apologies. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Uh, Council Quirt, I just wanted to just try and pick up on um, on your discussions about alcohol. I mean, alcohol is a very complex situation, um, as you are well aware. Um, uh, clearly, uh, there was less access to services during COVID in terms of um, uh, people being there. The unexpected consequences um, are actually more about um, um, how people are uh, transitioning or in treatment supporting others and running groups so the unlock is that people are actually being more supportive from those groups and helping others it was nothing to do with um, how deaths are influenced elsewhere from alcohol which is well known across the whole of you know uh, the island so I don't know if I've managed to answer that question here have I done that or not So the unintended consequences are that we've got more people who are willing to help others support. That's the unintended one. No, but yeah, but we've had a That's lot of interference. Sort of I think come in that helpful. Yeah, Simon Bryant would be able to clarify that a bit more clearly. But the, but the fact is, is, is that we have had more reforms because people are more feeling more able to access the service now, whereas some may have felt that they were blocked previously. So it's all about COVID and, and various different things. 
So I'll hand over to Simon Wright for that. Yeah, Councillor, you're, you're absolutely correct. What we're now seeing is more people accessing the service uh, and the period of time here, uh, those people. So we have seen a reduction in this um, graph because the people accessing treatment was at the beginning of COVID, so less people were accessing. And now we've had a, a, a quite a uh, significant increase in the number of being treatment, but it takes about nine months to go through treatment. So we'll see those figures pick up in time. But uh, it, as we come out of COVID, it's a positive story, as Councillor Love said, with more people being supported and more people um, volunteering to support as they come out of their own treatment. I, I think it's also important to just uh, pick up on the smoking uh, cessation is, is that, again, I've worked in smoking cessation for a very long number of years. You've got to remember that stopping smoking is quantified by three weeks giving up. That's what they call <laughs> the, uh, ceasing to, to, to smoke. Um, and um, the issues and the concentration for our teams are actually with a maternity unit in order to reduce smoking in pregnancy as much as possible. Um, and there's some work going on in and around that area. Um, as for vaping and various things, they've never been counted as part of the programme. And in fact, vaping is used as a way of actually uh, removing people from tobacco. So it's tobacco products that is counted as smoking. Um, and that's how it is reported nationally. Thank you. <clears throat> so the, uh, the other aspect to uh, bring out here was about uh, consistency within the reports that you get. You'll notice at the bottom of page 49 uh, that there's a reference to households in temporary accommodation. Uh, we, we have uh, housing and homelessness and related issues uh, ranging across a number of different portfolios at the moment. And we have this item already reported under a different portfolio. And so going forward, what we're going to do here is to take this, this item out of this portfolio reporting on these so that it appears in one place consistently uh, relating to that particular topic. So in, in the next ones, you will not see that uh, houses in temporary accommodation here and then repeated elsewhere in the documentation. That's completely redundant. And, and sometimes they're reporting on a different cycle, on a different month with different historical data. And it's better that we're very consistent so that we have a comparative basis going forwards. So if there were any other questions on that section, Absolutely. Um, a comment and a question. Um, on page 43 at the beginning of it, it says a focus on improving mental health and well-being is incorporated incorporated in all the activities across adult social care, which is really welcome. Um, but my, my firstly, my comment before I come to my question is shouldn't we have that right across all the departments? because actual mental well-being is involved in housing, in environment, you know, right across. Um, so I would like to see that incorporated in all the reports, um, a quarterly report. Yeah. My question is, okay. um, it says here, moving forward and enable a greater focus on mental well-being in our local communities. How is that going to be measured? <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, with great, great complexity. I mean, obviously, um, um, mental health is now the, one of the key focuses in moving forward right across the board. And so I would hope that all teams would be focusing on mental health. Um, it would be um, our intention to look again at um, um, the successful programme that was rolled out this year through through um, engagement of some finances and funding towards yourself um, in the mental health grants that we looked at. But, but we are looking at all indicators and we're asking people to give us reporting methods back. Um, to be fair, uh, we're not consistent yet in how we uh, gather that information. Um, and that's something that, that, that uh, certainly we can look at more closely as we move forward. Councillor Crook. Uh, just a, an observation. Um, a lot of our comparisons are with what happened in the previous year um, with COVID. A lot of our historic data is rather disruptive. Um, it might actually be quite good if we were looking at what we were hoping to achieve and set targets and then measured against a target rather than measuring against 
rather dubious historic data? Yes, yeah, so we, we, we try to do that often in the narrative in the right hand col column, which is to measure against performance. So some of them we do have performance characteristics which are in the charts and sometimes there isn't. Actually, it's simply a reporting of numbers, uh, what's actually happened historically. But I agree with what you say that during the COVID period, many of the figures are distorted and many of the graphs are distorted for it. There's also a delay often in the figures coming through. So although we might have come out of COVID and we're now starting to get metrics on issues again, there's uh, often quite a long cycle, particularly with some of the financial reporting um, in terms of when it actually comes into the charts. So we'll try and make them as clear as we can going forwards. And I think it's a continual process of improving the way that data is relayed back so that it can be scrutinised and the performance of the council can be evaluated. As clear as that. Chair, may I add that, that also a lot of the reporting depends on national uh, statistical timescales and time frames in terms of how we report it for public health. So we have to work to the national agenda in, in terms of providing data and we provide that data as is required by uh, legislation. Um, and that also sometimes throws off how we're able to report. I mean, we are talking sometimes very small numbers and if you only have one or two, that makes a big change in the statistical base. Um, so it's not a perfect system, which we recognise, um, but, this, but the re reporting basically through public health is through a national set of frameworks that we have to report on and that sometimes constrains us. And also, we have had quite a few members of staff missing or leaving or changing and that affects our ability to always report in the way that we would want to. Yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. so, uh, moving on to Appendix 4, just to highlight a few figures, then I'll pass over to Councillor Stevens, who might want to amplify some issues. Uh, uh, again, here we're trying to provide figures which are uh, referenceable and clear. And one of the issues that we've, we've had under housing and housing provision has always been this issue of affordable housing, what the term actually means. So uh, going forwards, and we've had some discussion on this already, uh, although the affordable uh, criteria are defined at a national level, uh, as we'll see later on with a report. They don't always apply in the same way to the island as they might to the UK as a whole. So in the next one, what we're going to do is talk about affordable properties based on two criteria that we've uh, come down onto so far. One is regarding a rentable and it's um, regarding the provision of affordable rental. And the figure we're using there is the figure that was quoted by the NSPCC that if a property, if rental properties are affordable, it means that they uh, are affordable based on 35% of the disposable income or 35% of the average income uh, of the occupier of the property. And if somebody has to pay more than 35% of their gross income um, uh, for rent alone, then clearly that is not an affordable rent. Uh, similarly, on the buyable one, we've picked up on the nationwide figure, which I noticed the, cons the, the consultants also referenced nationwide in their report. And there we're going to um, attempt to provide it based on three, four and five times uh, the household income. So affordable to buy uh, would be the number of delivered properties which are based on three, four or five times the average uh, income on the Isle of Wight, which is clearly quite different from other parts of the UK. Uh, and I think we'll already see from the report that what's happened over the last decade has been that prices on the Isle of Wight have accelerated away uh, from that that multiple so that uh, now to have an affordable on the Isle of Wight to meet the national criteria you'd have to have uh, a salary I believe in the report of 62 and a half thousand now clearly that is way beyond the average salary on the island and so our basis for measuring affordability must be based on the income on the island and not on some hypothetical figure which is used nationally so you will get more information out coming forward in future months um, we've had some discussion on it. I think those are going to be very valuable. And I'd also draw your attention on page 56 to the number of empty properties we have on the island, uh, which quite frankly appalls me uh, that we have a housing need on this island which is unmet. And at the same time, we have such a high rate of empty uh, or unused properties. Uh, and I'll pass over here to Councillor Steve and see if he wants to add anything to that. You virtually uh, encapsulated everything there, uh, Councillor Jarman. I say thank you. What I don't want to do is uh, repeat over what you've what you've said. But when we're looking at empty properties, and we're looking at about eight hundred and forty-six 
or thereabouts. Um, properties uh, empty and 121 or thereabouts uh, empty for over two years. And yet here we are saying we haven't got properties and, and what have you. We've um, we've really got to uh, focus on on housing and uh, homelessness because there are opportunities or there could be opportunities in the empty property area if we can move that forward. So I say, you know, we don't have to uh, pull a uh, cement mixer on site with 800, uh, 840 um, empty properties. We should be actually drilling that and seeing what we, what, what's there. So, um, I'd also like to um, mention that uh, second homes, there's uh, 2,709, and I say approximately because that obviously fluctuates as well, but 2,709 um, uh, second homes and holiday lets, we're talking about 1,290 at this present time. So if you add, if, if you add, add those things together, you can see that we could actually be um, driving forward um, in the right direction, a positive direction to um, assist with uh, our homelessness problem. So I want to leave it there because obviously there's other things that come on later, but uh, I think uh, Councillor Jarman uh, summed up everything. But I would like to say, you know, looking at the empty properties side of things and, and things that are already built, if we can make inroads into that, then that's where we, that's where we should be uh, pushing uh, initially. Thank you. If we keep any questions for item seven, because there's a lot on the house, so if we keep the questions on that, it's about housing for item seven, and we'll put it all into one place. Thank you. Could Continue, Councillor Jarman. Sorry, may I just ask one thing, picking up on Councillor Jarman's um, revised, as it were, um, it, um, definition of affordable housing now being based on income rather than property price. That's going to need a substantial amendment to the draft island plan, which sets out in some detail levels of percentage, as it were, of property value to determine um, affordable housing. So discount is in the island plan is entirely based on the percentage of the value of the property, not the percentage, as it were, of income. So that will, will it not require substantial amendment of the draft island plan? Um, sorry. So uh, I've discussed it with uh, Councillor Fuller. Um, he he feels that the information we will gain from measuring these numbers based on average income will be uh, uh, quite critical information to put into the island planning process. Of course, the island planning process relies on the national definition of what affordable is. So our use of the figures both for based on our island income will be I wouldn't want, to, wouldn't want to say it was anecdotal information because I think it's quite critical information to our considerations but it does provide a very different and a very real basis for us to engage in those conversations if for example we are at uh, considering an affordable development um, where we might ask the question how many of these are affordable, then the legal definition of that would be the national criteria affordable based on 80% of average market value. But there's nothing to stop us asking the similar question based on the statistics that we will now have. How many of these are affordable to rent based on the average income on the island? And how are we, meet, how are we meeting that demand on the island? And that's a completely different story. So I don't know how that will yet be reflected in the island plan. This is very new information, obviously, within the last few days but it's much more real and it's relevant to the people on the island, not to some hypothetical you know, national statistic. Is it regarding housing, Joe? Uh, I specifically on that. Yeah, I'll let you on that one then. Um, I mean, I do think there's scope for confusion here if the island planning strategy core key document is gonna to refer to affordable housing, that means one thing, and the council's other reports are gonna to refer to affordable housing, which means something else, our own measure. I'm not against our own measure, but if it can't be reflected in the island planning strategy, I think it's probably a recipe for confusion. So I think Councillor Fuller is very keen that it is used in the island plan strategy. He's made that very clear to us. Um, we don't have the first figures yet, and as soon as we got them, I think we, will, we might all breathe a, a deep in inhalation of breath when we realise, looking back, how many uh, have, have actually been delivered. 
The difference is affordable as in the national definition, and the other one is the figure we often refer to now, which is affordable to islanders. So we are drawing a distinction between the two, and I very much hope that that affordable to islanders is reflected vigorously in our planning strategy. I agree. Yeah. So, yeah, and then that, that will come down to us all as councillors in full council and the next corporate scrutiny to agree. And I think what I'm getting from from the both of you is that the most sensible measure is the lower measure. I think we probably all agree on that. That is going to cause a lot of problems, we know, but I think that's if you're going to set up targets, make them ambitious, I think. Karen, Councillor John. So I did, didn't have anything particular to raise on Appendix 5. I know it was missed out in the original circulation has come as a supplementary document, but I do know that Councillor Andre is here if there are any particular questions that people have on Appendix 5 for her. Councillor Paley. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I think it's really good to see how, uh, you know, we've seen the primary schools increase go into good um, obviously, we haven't had any secondary school inspections uh, yet, but this has actually led me to great concern after what I've read today about Medina, Carisbrook and Node Hill, looking towards academisation, how AUT managed the base school, which is now under local authority control. Um, and academisation could be a huge mistake for this school too. So I was wondering if the cabinet member could you know, reassure us how we can ensure the continuation of good schools, local authority schools, and, a stri and strive for outstanding schools in the island. Um, because we've seen how academisation has failed once. We've got really good schools here on the island at the moment, um, and they are, you know, ever increasing, but this could take us a massive step back. And it's just that concern after today, after seeing how good um, some of our schools are, and they are all progressing. So it's just how can we be reassured given this news today? It looks like Steve Crocker beat Councillor Andre to the council. <laughs> I'll let Steve Steve Crocker go first. Assuming that's you wanted to, Steve, and you didn't just turn your camera on by accident. Uh, not at all. I was uh, just making sure that people were aware that I was here, so I'm going to um, defer to uh, my cabinet member and, and, unless she wants me to come in. Thank, thank you, Steve. Um, and in turn, I'm actually going to ask of the chair Bearing in mind that at this point in the meeting, um, it's really to discuss items that are contained within the corporate scrutiny agenda. I'm wondering if that, I'm happy to give a comment, but I'm wondering whether that question might be better placed in members' questions. I'm quite happy to take it now, um, otherwise okay. I might in terms um, of the announcement that's been made today, of course, as I'm sure Councillor Palin is aware, the matter of academisation or not is actually one for the governing body of, uh, of the Island Federation, which is Carisbrook and Medina, which incorporates the sixth form. They have chosen to go out to parents in consultation um, which I think is, you know, their, their right to do, which is, which is um, we as a listening administration obviously welcome the fact that they are going out to consultation. And um, I'm sure that they will listen very carefully to the results that come back. At the end of the day, um, I think as, as Councillor Palin has also alluded to, the important issue here is delivering a high quality of education for our island children and whether that's through the academy model whether it's through la maintained school whether it's through church schools that will that is our focus as an authority it's the quality of education that is being delivered thank you i don't know if steve wants to add anything to that uh, uh, i think you're the only thing I, I not to add, but perhaps to reinforce that, um, as you rightly said, Councillor Andre, the it, it, it's a mix. The, the schools system is now a, a mixed system, and our job is to try to maximise the benefit for children on the island, whatever the system looks like. And um, and in fairness, we we work well with academy schools, we work well with maintained schools and church schools, and our job is to try to maximise that, uh, whatever the governance arrangements, and not let governments be too much of a distraction to the real job, which is uh, ensuring that children have a really good education. Thanks, Steve. Uh, does that answer your question, Cameron? 
if, you, if you're not happy, ask now. I, I mean, I, I'm feel, I, I get the feeling that this will come back at uh, other places, but if you're not happy, ask now. That's that's the point. You okay? All right, thank you. Carry on, Councillor John. So, uh, moving on to Appendix 6, it's a very short update. You'll see in Appendix 6. I didn't have any particular issues to raise there. If anybody has any questions, I probably won't be able to answer them in this portfolio, but I'll do my best and I apologise that Councillor Fuller isn't uh, with us today. Oh, several hands. Councillor Lilly. It, it's, it's just really a um, point of reference, mm -hmm. really. It says here about the peer review, LGA peer review on planning, which was which was excellent from my perspective. Um, would it be useful, uh, Chair, for that report when it's available? Hopefully, it will link to the Isle of Wight strategy meetings because there was some relevance in that LGA report. Uh, they were. I think there were comments regarding the island plan and its importance and, and side, which I think will be relevant to our discussions when we actually discuss the island strategy. So I just wanted to, could we make sure that that report is aligned to members at that time? It, it will go to Neighbourhood Regeneration Committee, and I would be very surprised and disappointed that if after the effort and the good work done, that that is there's nothing acted upon. But see, see, we'll go to the regeneration committee, so uh, you should we should see something. I just think you should link into our discussions. It, oh, absolutely, and I would, like I say, I would be very disappointed and surprised if we've got an outside body to do a piece of work and then we we don't either as officers or members take take note of it. So, okay. um, is there any particular action around that we need to take to make sure that happens? Is that in place? I think we can all assume that we are all eager to see the report and we are waiting for it and it will be. I think that that report alongside yes, yes, us looking at the at strategy, because definitely they had a perspective from other authorities, which was very useful in that debate. Hmm? Yes. Who's <clears> next? <throat> hmm? Sorry. Sorry, have you finished, Councillor Lilly? Yes, I have. Thank, yes. thank you. Councillor Adams, you're not warmed up. Cool. We've been awarded a million pound by the council's Brownfield Release Fund, the government's Brownfield Release Fund, to bring forward three council-owned sites for new housing. Could I just ask where those sites are? Councillor Stevens, microphone. Ian, microphone. Okay. Um, Thompson House, out of Sandy Lane, Berry Hill Lake. And I think it's Western, isn't it? Former Western yeah, West, the former Western school over at Tottenham. Who's next? Councillor Spink. Thank you, Chair. Um, on appendix six, page 59, um, the penultimate um, paragraph, officers are in discussion with the portfolio holder on how to take key activity in respect of greenfield sites not already allowed for in the draft plan forward within the context of the preparation of the island planning strategy and national planning policy and legislation. I'm not too sure what that penultimate paragraph means, quite frankly, and it may be that um, we need Councillor Fuller to explain it, but I had not thought that there was intended to be any as it were, planned for development on greenfield sites other than those contained in the existing draft plan. Whereas that does tend to suggest that there is discussion going on to allow for further development on greenfield sites. And I'd like to know the content of that discussion and um, the principle behind it. Fair question. Who wants to take that? Councillor Stevens? Councillor Jarman? Me too. <laughs> well, perhaps when Cal I think we'll ask for a written response from uh, Councillor Fuller on that. I would like um, a written response. Yeah, if, on this, that. if there's no clear, then rather than fudge it, yeah, are you okay with a written response from Councillor Fuller? Yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Um, you circulate to everyone, yeah. Thank you. And the only other question, and I think Councillor Jarman might be able to help here, I don't know, is the final paragraph, which I'll read. It's only three lines, so that it's sort of on the um, record, as it were. 
Sam anticipated that amending the council's constitution to allow representatives from town, parish or community councils to be non-voting members of the committee will be led by the monitoring officer, given it requires a change to the council's constitution code of practice. So presumably the committee referred to there is planning committee. And presumably the proposal is to have non-voting members of as it says, of um, the of um, local town and parish councils on the co planning committee. Um, I must say, perhaps I simply missed it. I wasn't aware of that proposal. And do, can it be explained how that would work? So, for example, would it be members of the planning of the parish commit committee of the parish council on the committee for the area, as it were, that the application is. So if there's an application for cows. Is it intended then that would, there would be members of cows, town council as non-voting members on the planning committee? And if so, would they not have to declare an interest? So I'm, I'm slightly confused as to how this would work. So I've not seen uh, any definitive proposal on this at all myself yet. So I think I'll defer to the monitoring officer, Chris, if you want to address this. I know you're going through looking at issues within the Constitution and the Code of Conduct at the moment. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Jarman. Um, yes, just to remind members, at the annual meeting, uh, members uh, uh, reinforced the fact that the audit committee itself is uh, responsible for reviewing the constitution etc and this proposal and indeed any other proposals will in due course be brought before the audit uh, committee uh, for consideration so any details will be provided at a later date um, the intention is for the next audit uh, committee to start that process and scope out you know what's involved in that that process and i think the central feature as would be expected is that there would be engagement with members on proposals and if there's any detail required further detail regarding any particular proposal then obviously that detail will have to be provided so it can be properly sort of uh, looked at by the audit committee and no doubt engaging in due course quite properly with uh, audit and scrutiny Thank you, Chair. Does that answer your question, Councillor? It Bingham? does, but I'd have a supplementary, if I may, and that that is um, is this. My understanding is is that in order for the audit committee to um, change the constitution or um, propose changes to the constitution, that would require in itself the change of the constitution. I seem to recall that appearing in um, Mr. One of Mr. Potter's reports. So it's far from set in stone, it seems to me, if I may say so, that the audit committee will be the correct body to carry out the changes, um, which would then have to be ratified by full council in any any event. So um, I think it would be of help. I don't know if corporate scrutiny thinks, but it would be of help, I, I would suggest, to have the bones of that set out for the next corporate scrutiny um, meeting in July. Chris? Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair, and thank you, uh, Councillor Spink. Um, I think it's a question of timing. Uh, certainly, sort of uh, uh, the next meeting of scrutiny is towards the end of, sorry, uh, the audit committee is towards the end of, of July. Uh, so, obviously, that would be the starting point. I'm happy to confirm, obviously, that uh, as Councillor Spink's rightly said, um, any ultimate decision on changes to the Constitution will have to be quite rightly put before full council for debate and decision. And as part of that sort of process leading up to that decision by full council at the appropriate time, then clearly one would expect um, involvement, as I said earlier, with audit and scrutiny, with the audit committee liaising with scrutiny to make sure that uh, we get uh, you know, fully informed decision making. Thank you. Uh, I, yeah, 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 just quickly. the other the other point is though that my understanding is in order for the audit committee to take on the function of reviewing the constitution, it is necessary to amend the constitution in order to allow it to perform that function. It doesn't at the moment have that function, as I understand it. Uh, Chris, and then Cameron. 
uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Council Speaker. Uh, the annual meeting, the, the, the point was raised by way of clarification in terms of terms of reference to the audit committee. So that's already effectively been clarified and done. Uh, what is required is obviously working closely with members to sort of work out the um, forward movement by way of engagement with members, the timescales, how that looks, whether by working group or by subcommittee or by a meeting of the committee itself. And also, as I say, behind the scenes, liaising with uh, fellow councillors to work that's, uh, at that particular programme uh, for the future. Thank you. So, so back to Councillor Spink's point, is the audit committee do have the authority to look at that? Thank you. Cameron. I was just going to quickly mention that my work is also already a non-voting member on planning committee as well. So um, obviously we have that connection with town and parish councils and we um, raise some of those concerns as well through our non-voting member. Councillor John, if you'd like to continue. Yes, thanks. Microphone. Sorry, one thing I did want to pull out here was on page 63, which is the average weekly wage on the Isle of Wight. Very relevant to our other discussions we've had going on. Uh, and you'll see that it is it is creeping up. Um, uh, although it looks quite a steep curve, of course, the index over which is measured on the left hand side is over a, a, a relatively narrow band. So which does slightly amplify that growth. But it does mean that the average wage on the Isle of Wight is, is gaining ground, one might say, in terms of the uh, the average figures within the UK, um, nothing like what the rest of the southeast is, but certainly heading in a, in a right the right direction. And I think Councillor Cameron has a question. When you're ready, to... uh, it was just on that point really, um, just obviously pointing out. You know, we are now at the level the southeast was seven years ago. The UK was three years ago. Obviously, despite everything increasing, um, is there anything that you know, as a council that can be done to help address this and support families, because obviously I know the administration have already put in things like the food pantry and the emergency free school meals vouchers, which have been a lifeline to so many. Um, is there anything that we can do to help drive that up? Or is it again relying on um, something discussed earlier about um, the island deal, about that, you know, driving inward investment as well? Well, I, I certainly don't feel that Although, although we welcome the idea of the pantries and we welcome all the foods and other support things we do and indeed with the council you know we're very proactive in getting grant schemes out there and communicating them in a way that's not um, an answer to the, the problem uh, that's a symptom i might dare to say uh, of the problem that we face um, clearly we have a growing population on the island but it's also interesting to realize that over the last five or six years the actual number of jobs on the island has been completely static at around 50,000. So although we've had a population increase, the actual working population um, within those jobs has remained static. And I think that's unfortunate because that indicates that we, re re we really have not been successful at regenerating and certainly of attracting businesses here and growing the economy in a meaningful way. And although we might get temporary short-term gains over some initiatives, we're not going to improve the lives of islanders uh, on, a, on a sustainable basis, unless the, the job opportunities are here, particularly for our young people. So I welcome the pantries, I welcome all the measures, I welcome the efforts by the council, but those are simply systemic problems within the economy that need to be addressed longer term. Councillor Love. Yes, just, I, I just wanted to come in the back of that, mm -hmm. um, is, is that uh, to just reinforce that, you know, food pantries, and food banks are not the way forward. They are a response to an increasing crisis which is starting to unfold and will, and will probably inf impact our communities in an even more negative way as we move into winter. I think it's really important to, to say that what we need to be focusing is the core root of, um, of poverty and we need to increase our uh, salaries right across the workforce and we need to look at the core the, you know, the, the core root of um, creating wealth and income for this for the island population. So whilst food banks and the community pantries seem a very positive thing, 
they're actually not a positive thing in reality because it means that people are having to rely on a support system that they shouldn't have to be relying on and therefore I would be really pleased to see this island without any of those services and um, and our economy being driven forward by um, all kinds of different measures from capitalism right through so um, so just needed to say that 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 you know there's this feeling that isn't it a really good thing that we've got pantries it's a good thing for those who are in need now it's not the future and should not be ever the future in the world's fifth richest nation. Thank you. Councillor John, can you continue? Yeah, so um, my apologies from um, on behalf of Councillor Bacon, who's had to depart today. He had a pre-arranged lift home and I don't think any of us anticipated the quite so many questions, but it's good that there are questions on this. I think that's exactly what the role of scrutiny is, is to pull the numbers apart. So on, on the section eight, which is the environment, heritage and waste, just to pull your attention to a couple of things. One is that um, you're, you're all aware that we'd uh, change some of the metrics regard, regarding the uh, economic model and the charging basis for uh, garden waste collection. But you'll see that the numbers have remained uh, relatively static. Um, it does look like fairly dramatic change on page 66, but it's really a reflection of the indices again on the left hand side. Um, it's actually only a reduction of 12. What I would like to do is pull your attention to the bottom of page 67, which is again, I'm, I'm using my, my own personal interest here, perhaps unduly, um, which is interesting to look at where the uh, the carbon load for the island is coming from. I just find this particularly interesting that we've started to get some of these figures uh, and we have a breakdown here of what's actually coming from commerce and industrial use on the island, what's coming from road transport and from heating. And uh, I think when we look at how we tackle carbon and we move to a zero carbon economy, we often have a great deal of focus on housing and insulation, and I'm not taking anything away from that. But I think if we're to move to a zero carbon economy, we need to tackle all the sources of carbon emissions on the island uh, simultaneously. So that's why I think it's quite interesting to have those figures broken out here. So unless there are any questions on that section. Moving on. Oh, there is. Councillor Lee. It's a, it's a it's more of asking uh, something for future out of these reports. I, um, I think it's it would help perhaps for future meetings that we have a case study, one of, of that, so we can actually what see what success actually looks like uh, with some of these projects. Because the report is full of actually some good news. There's obviously quite a lot of of negatives and you know doing better and everything but it would be uh, useful i mean i'd particularly like the the, the branston you know um within that uh, i just think it would be helpful to this committee at the future meeting just to have a slot where there's a case study of something we can physically visit see right you know um uh, within that so there's something out of the figures uh, I'm a, I'm a qualitative scientist when I, for, for many years. I prefer to actually see a case study than alongside the statistics and, and, and the graphs and whatever. So can you just think, can we incorporate that? Because I think there's in both set appendix seven and eight and some of the other appendices, there was a, a little bit of good news stories of successes. Can, if we I, just, uh, can we just bring those out? It, it, I will disagree there, Councillor. I'm afraid this is performance review and that's what it's for. Uh, it's up to Cabinet what they want to send out. What this doesn't become is a part of the broadcast for anybody. So I will disagree with you there. And I think it's more important we look at that. Uh, and I, 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 I know I get what you're saying, but the opportunity that, yeah, the opportunity for the case studies, the opportunities for the case studies, uh, I agree with you, but not not in this meeting. So I think we've got enough other business to go, and we could end up getting bogged down for an hour at a time. And it's a very good point, Michael. I do agree with you, but just not not in this committee. Um, so if you'd like to continue, Councillor John. Right. So uh, I beg to differ, but I accept your view. I, I will inquire of Councillor Bacon if there's an opportunity to bring forward into another forum uh, something which is a demonstrable deliverable as a case study to show what we've actually achieved within that carbon area. I'm sure he has numerous examples. So moving on to Appendix 9, uh, which is highways, infrastructure and transport. Again, I have to apologise here um, 
for Councillor Jordan, who I believe is still trapped in France, having had his return trip cancelled uh, and is in uh, trying all means to get home, I'm sure. Um, within this, I don't have anything in particular to bring forward, um, but if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to try and deal with them or indeed to uh, to take them off offline with Councillor Jordan upon his return. Councillor Robson. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, there is no, there's no reference to the floating bridge in this quarterly report. I, I think it might be quite helpful to have a, a reliability graph of the floating bridge. It's one of the key responsibilities as, as headed at the top of page 69. I agree. We'll let you take that back to Councillor Jordan. <laughs> um, Thank you, Councillor Rogers. Yes, I mean, we do We do actually have um, in our cost overrun, which was reported, I think, in the last service of accounts, which is something in excess of 400,000 relating to the floating bridge. Um, for those of you who go through the, the numbers that get reported back anyway. So I think that's the end of the section. And if there are no further questions on it, um, I'd like to uh, suggest that we will endorse this report and accept it as proposed. Well, I think, oh, Councillor Lever. Councillor Lever. Sorry, just one last thing from me. Um, just disappointing to see the number of public transport users going down, um, given the fact that uh, only 14.1% of the island's population are living in town centres, which would indicate that we're very much a rural island in terms of population. And given the fact that road transport is the second highest emitter on the island, um, I'd just be interested to see the strategy for for increasing public transport users. So, so there is a transport strategy which you, you may not have received yet, but which is coming along. Um, I'm not sure if it's actually in the cabinet papers this time or next time, but I know there is a transport policy which is coming out. We do, of course, continue to fund uh, quite generously through to um, the Vectors buses to make sure that those rural routes are maintained and are kept open. Otherwise, I think they wouldn't be. And our funding of them is, uh, you know, is a considerable amount uh, for a council this size. Um, the question is how we continue to incentivise people uh, to use public transport. Um, anecdotally, I have to say recently, I've seen an inordinate number of cyclists very welcome on our roads, uh, which is helping to uh, educate our road users a little bit in terms of how to behave with them. And of course, uh, I do, do almost emphasise it when I'm overtaking a cycle to cross completely to the other side of the road, hoping the traffic behind me will learn a lesson and follow as well to make our roads safer. Introducing other cycleways onto the island, I think will also help. Um, and I think it's a continuing process of education as well. Uh, I did see some other figures about uh, car usage, uh, which was, uh, I think, somewhat uh, continuing, perhaps because of COVID and people's uh, concerns about using public transport, which is the legacy issue. You know, when people are dissuaded from using public transport, they have to be enticed back to it. They become quite car friendly and car dependent, which is unfortunate. And I think we have to do everything we can to continue to advertise and promote the use of public transport. Wendy. Thank you, Chair. And just to add to what Councillor Jarman has said, I think it's important in terms of the number of public transport users that we realise that the data that we're using is from 2020, 2021, which of course was at the point of time when we were in lockdown and active use of public transport was discouraged. So I would hope that we will see a change coming forward. But you're absolutely correct, Councillor Lever, that kind of thinking around how do we positively impact getting people back into public transport again is really important. Councillor, is a response to that question in particular? Yeah, uh, uh, yes, it is, yeah. Um, um, yeah. We need to understand the, the, the core, you know, the, the business behind uh, the statistics, really. And um, whilst people talk about forcing people, not forcing, but encouraging people back onto transport, it might be that they're switching to other forms of transport, and we need to understand that, such as the scooters, cycling, etc. So it's not a straightforward, um, 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 let's have people back on buses. It might be that we, what we're really looking for is, is, is alternative transport to, to um, cars. And I think that that's something that needs to be looked at rather than just trying to focus on the public transport element. 
Thank you. So, uh, thank you, Councillor John. Um, I propose we accept the report as as written. Um, do everyone accept? Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you. That's gone on a bit longer than I, I planned, but thank you because that was some very very good question. And that is, after all, the point. Was, so, thank you for bearing with. So, who's taking the affordable housing report? I hope someone is. It's quite a weighty document. <laughs> Councillor Stevens. I didn't realise you'd want me to introduce it and read it as it's written there. So, I mean, I've come here all prepared to give a, um, a presentation. I think we all know um, what the situation is, and I think we all know the mountains we have to climb. Um, and just a, a bland title of affordable housing is not really what we're not what we're looking at. We're looking at affordable housing for island residents. And that's the big thing. We've got we've we've got formulas there. And if you look at page 73, uh, you can see how much you need to buy a house. If you go over to page 74, um, paragraph 10, open market rents are 733 on average. Um, and they're deemed unaffordable by 40% of our pop our population. And it is not where we want to be. It's, um, I've heard um, people talk about the modular homes and when, when that was put through um, cabinet on the 14th of October last year, I thought we, I thought we'd, we'd got a, a ray of light that we could actually start to work on things. Here we are heading into the summer and into the summer in actual fact looking outside and we're no further forward. We're no further forward at all. And I wonder, you know, I mean, the trips that I've made to County Hall during that period, and indeed uh, all of you, and all the effort we've put in, all of the uh, thought, all of the discussion, we're all on board with this. And yet, I look and see that the impression I thought we were going to make at the outset as ground to a, if it ever got traction, as ground to a halt. I'm thankful that the leader has decided to reshuffle the cabinet and give me the opportunity to focus on housing, homelessness, and what we were referring to just now, poverty. Because those are the elements I want to reach out. I want to reach out to uh, across the chamber, of course. I want to uh, speak to my colleagues um, uh, in the alliance about. We've got uh, shocking figures for homelessness, shocking figures for um, empty empty properties. Not much being done, you know. And I, I'm starting to think the council is not configured to um, how it should be working. At the current time, and that's not that's not having a go at the previous administration. That's saying, okay, we're in a different we're we're in a different uh, uh, section now. Let's drive it forward. Let's start to make let's start to make um, a housing department of sorts where we can pull in things, make it fit for purpose. And so the leader has acceded to my um, shouts. Uh, about how how we should be doing this, and I and I, as as I say, there's been a little little bit of a reshuffle, so that we can home in on the things that matter to our residents, so that we can home in and take things forward in the appropriate manner. Now, the, poverty doesn't recognise politics. Poverty doesn't recognise an individual, um, you know, that's that's got an awful amount of money. But has no care, has, uh, shall we say, no money, but has a carer. There's, there's a big, there's, there's a big melange of, of, uh, of requirements and wants out there, and 
to say that I'm just going yeah, to I'm talk. I'm going to raise the to that point of order. Yeah, to say that I'm just going to talk talk about this. And I'd like to raise the point of order. Of course, of course. Speech, yeah. If it is a point of order, it is a point of order. The agenda item is to consider a report looking at the actions being taken regarding the provision of affordable housing for island residents as one of the council's key activities within the corporate plan. And the report produced is at page, I think it's 71. Now, um, for Councillor Stevens to go on uh, making a speech now about other matters and cabinet reshuffles is not an agenda item. And I would like to hear his views, as it were, based on the report that has been provided, all four pages of it. I think it's a fair point. If we take it as a jumping off point, because I think we're right, there's a lot. I mean, you've got the rest of the report as well. You've got all the way through to page 316 in the detail of the report. Um, if we take that as a jumping off point, then, if, if you want to give us a quick pricey of what, you, what your view of the report is, and then I think we'll take questions around it. Thank you. As I say, um, as far as I'm concerned, We've got a mountain to climb. We will, we will climb. But as I say, this is a, this is a, a report that isn't just over this year, but it's it's it touches on previous years, which I'm not here to uh, um, blast away. But as I say, we're we're relying on affordable homes or percentage of affordable homes from um, property developers. We're not hitting the not hitting anywhere near the targets we have for a few years. Um, I'd like to talk about the um, medium incomes, etc. And if you if you look at that um, and the uh, affordable home ownership option scheme on page seventy four, um, help to buy, uh, help to buy shared ownership first first homes uh, thirty percent discount, help to buy shared own ownership at twenty five percent. We've got uh, we've got uh, uh, pathways in place. But unfortunately, with the income uh, obtained uh, for island families, uh, people cannot afford it. And therefore, we have to consider new objectives and taking it forward. Now, I've got no, no projection here to take it forward. Um, uh, but all I will say is that the, um, the island's uh, uh, housing strategy has got four, um, uh, four overarching uh, uh, themes, people, properties, place, and partnerships, and and those are the areas that we're going to we're going to try and apply it to, if we can get, a, or shall we say, when I can get things uh, um, replaced and and reformed to make a more uh, robust and sustainable uh, housing unit within the Isle of Wight Council, and I know that the um, the chief exec is only too uh, pleased to be on board and to assist us with it. But as I say, um, you've got the paper in front of you. You've read it. Um, to deliver these pri priorities, here we are again, um, with Councillor Spink, setting out clear and strong planning requirements in our emerging island planning strategy, continuing to cha champion sustainable development, sustainable and location, seeking high quality design from any new developments, help promote the positive benefits of new development to the island's future, um, sustainability, and continuing to support the retrofitting of existing stock. And that's one thing that we will come on to in, in future months with retrofitting future stock and making them, uh, bringing them up to scratch with uh, uh, making, making things um, a little bit cheaper on the um, uh, energy front, but also making sure that our that those in need have a house that is uh, 2022 and not uh, 1920. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Stevens. And um, I'll, I'll come to Councillor Robert first, but I'll just do a little summary just so we're, we're all on the same page. Is we have the main data I've got from this is there's 66,108 households on the island. And it's growing at around 531 a year. 12,368 have in private rent. We have 3,054 second homes, 1,290 holiday lets. We have 2,645 households on the housing register. 
of those 1,974 require one or two bedroom properties, 382 need three bedroom properties and only 109 need four bedroom properties. So that's just gives an idea where the housing need is. Um, affordable home requirement is 783 per year, which nets in terms of ones we haven't got to 372 a year. So with that information, Councillor Roderick, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, the report that's presented in front of us is four and a half pages with, a, with an appendix, with an attachment. The first 19 of the 21 paragraphs set out the problem, and I've got no criticism with that. But the agenda item is to consider a report looking at the actions being taken. And we're now 15 minutes in, and I've heard nothing about the actions being taken. In fact, Councillor Stevens, you said it had ground to a halt. And in the report itself, I cannot see any actions being taken. So if we look at the two paragraphs at the end of the report, paragraph 20, that sets out the priorities that would, were set out by the previous administration. They're lifted from a document with a, a, a jolly picture of former Councillor uh, Barry Abrahams on the front. That sets the context. Now, how are they going to be delivered? Paragraph 21 says to deliver these priorities, three of the bullet points have got nothing to do with affordable housing. High quality design, I'm all in favour of that, but how are you going to deliver affordable housing? The first bullet point, the only one that seems to address it at all, is the island planning strategy. And that's been deferred to September, a year and a half after this new administration began. So my question is what are you actually doing as a council to deliver affordable housing and indeed a year in what have you done thank you thank you at the outset when i first started speaking i said that we and i don't as i say i, I don't criticize uh, uh, previous administrations or other administrations. But what I do say is that we endeavoured throughout the period uh, prior to the chief exec moving on to get the system that we had in place that we'd inherited to work under the present uh, under the present uh, um, and current circumstances. It doesn't work. We've got to change it recognize that got a new chief executive in and we will change it and I will be I, and, and I will be speak I, I will be speaking uh, to you councillor Robertson as I will do to uh, other other councillors and other parties and other groups I think that's the way that we've got to do this I think that you know this is this isn't a one-man fight or a one man one man um, act this is actually the Isle of Wight council will all, all we're all a part of. I want I want us to achieve. I've just read out some some chronic um, figures. I'm not hiding that, and I'm certainly not hiding that the um, uh, that the framework that we were working to. Well, it's obvious it didn't. It did not produce what we wanted it to produce. Now I'm going to say that hands up, right? Not many people come into the council chamber and say it's. It's not work. If you've met one here, I don't hide. We've got to fix it. We've got to change it. We've we've already started. And to be quite to be quite honest, I, I've I found that the uh, the the chief exec is um, up to up to change and, and doing uh, and doing the right thing to make sure that we get uh, a housing and homelessness um, service that is going to be fit for purpose for this island and fit for purpose for the side of white council. Thank you. Councillor Robertson. Hey, I've got this uh, I, I, I always welcome um, uh, offers to walk, work cross party. Can, can I make a suggestion to the cabinet member? This council has a company set up to deliver affordable housing. That company existed when he came into office over a year ago. In February, this council voted to give it 40 million pounds of funding. 
it's still listed as dormant on company's house. It's not a structural problem, it's a delivery problem, and he's in the top job to deliver. Please, can you deliver affordable housing through that company by moving, taking out of its dormant status, employing staff, and getting it going, rather than talking about structural problems that I'm not convinced actually exist. I think it's a delivery problem. Thank you, Councillor Robertson. You, you know, we're we're on the same path. We're on the same path, except that you know, I, I'm I'm more conciliatory and uh, moving forward together. You're a little bit, you know, and and quite rightly so in your role in in, in scrutiny, asking, asking, and and pushing a little bit. But what I would say is that. The, I've asked the questions about the company. I've asked a question many a time about the uh, about the company. I want to I want to get that company to be uh, working legally and with governance, the required governance and producing. Now I've asked I've asked the questions a, a few times since I've been in it. I'm not this, this isn't this isn't pushing the blame. I've asked the questions. We'll get the answer. We'll get it moving. I'm going to leave it at that. But understand me. I, I do. I, I I don't just turn up and be told and then and then go away. I, I've actually pushed and asked asked questions on on many on, on many uh, occasions. Okay, I've got a long list of, of questions. Should I just say as well that you didn't give a company forty forty uh, million pounds. You gave us access to go and apply apply for that, and since since that's uh, since that's come up, we've also got to by all accounts, according to uh, our section one five one officer, make a five to six percent uh, return on that. Okay, I've got a long list of questionnaires that go in this order: Councillor Palin, Councillor Adams, Councillor Quirk, Councillor Love, Councillor Spink, Councillor Lilly. So if we start with Councillor Patton. Just a really quick one. Um, first, just to say thank the Cabinet, because we have our monthly meetings with them as I work, and it's something that we have discussed recently. Um, but the question, obviously, is about, we've obviously seen uh, Ukrainian refugees come and live here on the island, which we very much welcome. But could um, housing them in the future, um, you know, kind of exasperate the problem? Because we want to ensure they've also got homes here on the island and feel welcome. We do not house at this moment in time um, any of our U Ukrainian um, refugees. And in the future, who knows? But I would say that, that rather than exasperate and um, destroy the fabric of our um, offer, off, our housing offering, I think that, uh, you know, people that come to the Isle of Wight to work, whether they're Ukrainian or, or um, other nationalities, are most welcome. And uh, we welcome them with open arms and we make sure that we can give them support if they need it, as they will give us support if we need it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Adams. Thank you. Uh, without making this political, it's, I think you've made very valid points, Joe. And uh, I also think Ian has. But I think if we're totally honest here, we're all up against this as a council and we really need to work on this cross chamber. Because this policy comes from government, and I think we all respect that to a certain extent, our hands are tied. And it's, uh, I mean, we're here lately on the news, Johnson declaring, he's going to sell off the homes, give them the right to buy from these housing associations. We, you know, we can argue, Joe, when we look back. The, if we look back when the council stock has been sold off, it's never been properly replaced. To continue further selling this on, Joe, it, I believe, and it's only my opinion, it's, but I believe this creates a recurring problem. And I think we need to try and work as a cross council on government policy that if we get, I would love us to get access to this 40 million and use it in a very positive way. But I would like to see it used maybe for replenishing some proper council stock that the council keeps retain of. We retain the land, which is the most valuable asset it sits on. We retain the stock. It's not sold off after 12 months at a huge discount because we've built it. And 
I believe that's the way to go. And that's the first step to me on the ladder to helping the people most in need. Councillor Quirk. As it was put to me, can I, it's, it's not contentious, just a, a small point. I mean, we have a housing company to actually do this, and we have voted to provide the money through borrowing to actually do it. And we don't have to sell the housing. It's there. It's ready to do. We agree. Can we just do it? You can't do it, Councillor Adams. I can't do it. But the cabinet member and the, the department can make it happen. And those houses don't have to be sold. They can be retained by the council and replenish the stock. Everything is ready to go. And it has been for four months in terms of the funding and longer than that in terms of the company. Thank you. Uh, I, I will just I will just say uh, from personal experience working with Southampton Council and their own uh, housing companies, they were very their advice would be very wary. It isn't as quick, unfortunately, as you think. It's actually quite a slow process. But I'm not going to let anyone off the hook for that. Moving on, Councillor Quirk. The saying goes, "Lies then lies in statistics." Um, the first page of this paper uses a medium, and that's a really bad uh, usage of statistics. Uh, a mean is more relevant uh, because the median, if you've got one uh, house at 10 million pounds and a thousand flats, uh, 100,000 pounds, they both get the same weighting. And it, so it puts the, it inflates the median. The median is always much higher than the mean. So it's a, it's a bad use of statistics. You should look at the mean, but what we should really be looking at is there are quartile earnings. And in the paper that's behind it, they actually do that. But the, I, th I think this is a, um, the first page of this is not looking at it in the right way and it's inflating the amount and it's suggesting that lots of people who could actually put uh, afford houses on the island can't. And I think that does us a disservice. Um, when I bought my first house, I did it with my wife, there were two incomes. Uh, if you double the, the uh, average income on the, someone full time working on the island, it's not far short of what it says here. And that's an inflated price. But I think you, you need to be realistic with the statistics that you use and the numbers that you use. Thank you. Councillor Love. Do you want to respond to that, Councillor? No, just briefly. Um, you, Councillor Quirk, and, 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 and indeed others um, have uh, residents within your ward that are feeling, are feeling um, the pressure of uh, lack of funding, um, no uh, guarantee of a roof over their head, and I think that that's the that's the flavour. And I understand, I take on board what you say, but that's the flavour of how 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 this paper is, is that it's it's not an all singing or dancing. Look, we're we're on the road to to um, success. It's pointing out that we're we're in dire times, and we're and we're really. Um, up against them, and so are the residents. I mean, we're sat here. We're going home tonight and open our front door. Some of those people, I've I've got um, families in in uh, caravans. I've got uh, families in bed and breakfast. You know, and and this and this is it. And they're and they're trying to uh, bring their young children up uh, to actually be educated and appreciate our society. So, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not apologising for the front page. I'm just trying to point it out that um, it's not all, uh, it's not all a bit of roses. Thank you, Councillor Love. Thank you, Chair, for allowing me to speak. I'm not really committed. Um, we spend a lot of time talking about the problem, and we need to spend a significant amount of time talking about the solution. There. There are structural problems with that company. The council cannot operate in the same way that a private building company does. And so we're not able to move quickly. And that's part of the problem and understanding that problem um, because we just cannot move that quickly. And um, this administration is having the same problem as the previous administration in activating that building company. It's been there quite a long time in dormancy. And, and it's because of all of the technical problems that go to it, uh, uh, sorry, as a result from it. The right to buy is not going to help us at all because the right to buy will only impact upon those houses which we do build unless we actually do establish that company for us to, to build. So the solution, 
Nobody wants houses in their back garden. Everybody says that. Nobody wants. So the solution is that we're going to have to start building upwards in order to start accommodating the numbers of housing that we need, whether if we like it or not. That is the only solution without going on to green belt okay, or green field. So we need to focus on the solutions. And it does keep stalling because of all of the different um, things which are happening both governmentally and locally and financially. You know, £40 million um, doesn't go very far, but by often by the time we would want to move to buy a property, because of the time it takes in terms of developing the business case, those properties are no longer available to us. And that is a huge problem which we've got to overcome. So, so I think that what we need is, is a, a bigger think tank cross party to look at the solutions and how we move that forward. But the reality is nobody wants houses in their back garden. And I'm going to suggest that actually there's a lot more happening than what we actually give ourselves credit for. And I think the person that really knows those answers is sat here behind me. So I don't know whether, the, whether that would be appropriate to ask. Well, some questions just and answers, to give, though, if you have some answers, uh, uh, Chris, please do. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I hear what the, obviously the committee has said in relation to the consideration of the report. Uh, it's difficult in some occasions to identify what a committee's objectives are in relation to their interest in a particular topic. This is this issue and this topic, as Councillor Robertson rightly said, has been a, a matter of concern for both administrations for a significant period of time. A housing strategy that is referenced as an appendix in the report gives a detailed action plan around each of these key aspects of challenge that we face. That strategy was, pub was published and completed on the eve of the pandemic. The impact of the pandemic has clearly had a significant exacerbating effect on our housing market, but the instruments that are set out in the housing strategy are still the right tools in the box to resolve those problems. The council in this administration in particular has been uh, determined to secure all the support that's available, particularly from central government, to help with these crisis situations we find ourselves in. So the acquisition of emergency housing um, in the market to actually address that homelessness pathway is a significant achievement over the last 12, six months. The action and activity and investment we put into the island planning strategy is absolutely fundamental to giving market confidence and clarity and direction around certainty of decision making or planning. That is fundamental to a successful and functioning housing market. So all of the challenges we faced in relation to achieving that objective and the committee's help, help on that at its next meeting will be particularly valuable, need to be addressed. And finally, the issue in relation to the development of the, the housing company and specifically the opportunity that presents in the market it is one only one element. The housing strategy in particular is more of an enabling piece. And what we've seen as a result is the bringing forward of land through government finance, through investment by our housing associations, and bringing forward a pipeline of projects to tackle that out, direct unit completion um, that we have a challenge facing ourselves on. So in bringing forward that strategy, the document, the report really sets, I think, as Councillor Jarman referred to earlier on, some interesting context for the committee to consider in relation to our specific challenges around affordability. Again, I would, I would recommend to the committee that it's difficult to find another authority that has a better understanding of this problem in relation to our local housing market. But what the report does then is reference in terms of the actions so far and continuing actions, the housing strategy document. Uh, which has its own action plan within it. So happy to take advice from the committee on any further information on the back of today tonight's report that they might require, and obviously support the committee's recommendations on next steps in relation to tackling this important topic. Thank you. Chris, we'll carry on with questions. Councillor Spink, I'll come back to you later. Chair. Yes. Chair, having heard what's been said, it's perhaps not a question, but a suggestion if I may make it, and that is this. Corporate scrutiny called for an update effectively in writing on where we were, as it were, as a council with affordable housing for island residents and the progress that has been made 
to this date and also looking at um, the future. Now, that's what we called for and we've not received that. We've not received that and we're hearing um, policy for the first time given already at this meeting. My suggestion is that the, or my statement firstly is, is that the four pages, and even if you read the whole of the Hearn report, it doesn't direct us, it doesn't tell us what we asked for. It does not tell us what's been done so far and what's going to be done in the future. Now, in order to, I would suggest that we've asked for that, we haven't had it, May we have it, please, in writing for the next Corporate Scrutiny Committee, unless you as chair feel we should have an extraordinary meeting to discuss it, um, rather than leave it till the next time. Because the, the, the point is that people um, who are homeless need action, and they need action yesterday. And for them to know that this is being adjourned to another meeting, um, and that effectively, as I understand it, the Alliance are saying that because of procedural difficulties, they've really not been able to do anything and don't seem to have any plans, um, is extremely worrying, both to um, members of this council and also, I suggest, to, the, to the, the, the people struggling on the housing register. So I would ask, please, that we don't continue this meeting fishing in the air, as it were, but we have a report which answers the question that we asked, and we then move forward uh, once we've got that written report. I prepared a whole string of answer, uh, questions, but there's no point in me asking them if policy is going to made up, be made up on the hoof. And also, if Councillor Stevens is simply going to say, well, it's a difficult problem, I don't really have a solution, I'd like to talk to the other side about it. Fair point. I think I'm, I am sensing this frustration from everybody in the room about progress. I don't think you're on your own, Councillor Spink. I think you're right. Progress uh, to date would be good along with the future. In terms of an extraordinary meeting, I don't think we'll be able to get one in before July. And also, we have to bear in mind that uh, this committee isn't the one that does the action. So, you know, we aren't stopping any houses being built by not having another meeting. But, but thank you for that. Um, Councillor Lilly, then Councillor Jarman, and then back to Councillor Robertson. Thank you. Um, I will be, after I pointed out certain things, um, putting forward a proposal uh, to establish a task and finish group, because part of Scrutiny's role is to work alongside uh, the ruling administration and actually look. And in fact, there was a cross-party uh, housing group um, back in 2017. Uh, that I was part of, I think Councillor um, Quirk was part of, which actually did um, really dig down with the, the administration at that time and looked at good practice. That report is actually, I, I still think, a very good document uh, within that. So I feel that it, because it is such an important thing and because we do need to, uh, as all councillors, uh, show the our community that we're really sort of tackling that. Um, I will be proposing um, the establishment of, of a task and finish group uh, within this and, and asking for a seconder. But there was, I just wanted to generally make the, the point. Um, one was, you know, in relation to the immediate crisis of people uh, in housing need, there is another cabinet paper which is actually looking at that particular uh, side, which we haven't actually mentioned, which is on the cabinet agenda. Uh, then I think on Monday now, the cabinet meeting, which is actually looking at that cold face, at the reality if someone is come. And we, we have to accept that certain things are happening. And I, and I welcome this report because it does actually for the first time for me as a councillor put some of the the economics of it and the reality and does give the case of the fact that um, for an ordinary hard-working family that has an income in this island is they're not earning enough to get a mortgage 
And if you ask the estate agents of this island, the group, they have said for the last five years, nearly 80% of houses are sold by cash on this island. Okay. There is can very I give you to a, few, can I give you to a point though, Michael? Very question. few of that. We have to accept that a lot of landlords are actually um, evicting people this autumn. They were protected, people were protected through COVID. That legislation come. And do you know the biggest reason why private landlords in Ride, and, and Ride is very reliant uh, on you know, one bedroom, two plant and flats, is because they can get more money by Airbnb, right? And that, one landlord's got 20 properties, right, in my ward alone, and he is taking action against all his tenants. Some of them have been there for many years, right, because he wants those to go into Airbnb. We have got under, my point is we've got underlying uh, issues, which this report is just the tip of the iceberg on. And we need to really focus on, on that. Um, and I do believe if you actually link into the cabinet report on the emergency, is the council to do it. My last point is before the council does anything, it has to create a housing department and bring the all the agencies. It was split up some years ago, and I won't go into that. But you've got housing with an adult social care. You've got housing and building control. They used to be, when I first started as a councillor, in one floor and they worked together. And some of those officers are privately said to me, right, it was the worst move that they were split up because they shared, the empty property officer would share information with others and they would then come up with solutions. They now don't even know where each other are in a lot of cases. We need first to get all those officers together in a housing department. The, the, the council started by getting the deputy leader to have a housing cabinet role of, of, of that. My, going back to my proposal, by actually having a task and finish group, we can actually have those discussions about the different nuances that have come out of this report. We can look at best practice, uh, which we're now doing with LGA peer reviews and that. What's happening in Cornwall? What's happening on the Houses of Silly? What's happening in other places that we look to and how we sort of resolve it? And we can work alongside can you work finding solutions. Move along. So, I wish to put forward a proposal that we establish a task and finish group from this committee to work alongside the cabinet member housing uh, and, and the relevant officers like uh, uh, Chris Ashman to be able to track this development so we get to the point of council spring that we actually do have answers. Uh, my I would like a seconder from my, my, my concern with a task and finish group, bear in mind what both the Council Spink, Council Robertson, Council Adams, Council Stevens have said, is that we're talking about talking about a problem we're already fairly well. No, it's, it would... And I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to get in the way, way of democracy and I, and I will allow you to vote on it, but my concern is that we're going to get nowhere. We've got a team that are focused on it. I think what we need to do is agree that we're actually going to work across party, and I think that'd be a better use of our time. I will come to somebody in the end. Group does that. But, but, it works across we, party. We're, we're struggling for resources already, and you know, you referenced a very good report that was written the last time around that hasn't solved the problem. And my concern is we're creating hot air, and we haven't even got a structure to put it inside of. So I think oh. we need to focus on that. If, and, if and you then know this, what I, what I did. Do council right. council quickly is I'm not a hot air. I actually do. Not you. I didn't mean. I meant all of us. I think, that, and I, I don't level that. And I level it as much as myself because I haven't solved the housing problem. If we move through the rest of the question, I'll come. You, you're on the list, Joe. Don't worry. If we've got councillor, sorry, we've got I will question. second that. Okay. So a motion on the floor. So okay. So uh, those in favour of setting yeah. up. A, yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I think you should debate it. Yep. You should allow comment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. I, I, 
That's a fair point, Vice Chair. Thank you. Councillor Robertson. I, I agree with you, Chair, on the um, proposal that's been put forward to set up a, a, a task and finish group. I think it's a considerable embarrassment to this council that we have a housing strategy that we're already halfway through, a five year strategy we're halfway through. And in this forum, with all the relevant decision makers in the room, all we can agree is there's a crisis and it's tough to solve it. I don't think a task and finish group is going to cut through any of that. I think it could do harm because I think it could distract from progress. I think there are so many distractions, so many platitudes, so many statistics that can give us a reason why we're doing well. Don't worry, it'll be solved soon. I think action can only be delivered by the executive. This is a cabinet council. The cabinet must take responsibility for the issue. And if it can't, then members who feel they can't deliver should stand aside. But I'm, I'm willing to back you, <laughs> Councillor Stevens, to deliver it. But it's got to be on your shoulders and it's got to be on the shoulders of the department in this council or the multi departments who are set up to deliver it. Because if residents are watching this, I think they will have less confidence than they had at the beginning of the meeting. And I don't think they had very much then. Councillor Spink. Yes, Chair, I just on this point. Um, I think the starting point, if I may say so, is my suggestion that we have a report from um, the cabinet, uh, namely the report that we requested and is, is set out in the agenda item at seven. Once we've got that report, then it can either be, as far as I'm concerned, it can either then be uh, decided, as it were, by cabinet or by a cross party group. I'm not against that by any stretch of the imagination. Or if you want to call the cross party group a task and finish group, it doesn't matter what name it has. So I'm not against, as it were, the, the, the proposal, but I do think that as a starting point, we need in writing from the cabinet minister, uh, Councillor Stevens, we need to know what actions have been taken regarding the housing crisis, what actions are proposed and a clear outline of what the problems are. That's what we asked for, although we didn't ask specifically for the problems. What we've got, in fact, is all the problems in the report and none of the solutions. So I would like to know if one's going to set up a, a group to look at this, one needs to know the starting point. And I don't know, for example, what work has been done in the last year by the cabinet on this issue because it hasn't really been published. And I thought today was going to be, but it's not. So um, I don't mind what you call it, whether it's cabinet's responsibility, um, which uh, Councillor Robertson makes a good point. It is really cabinet's responsibility. On the other hand, if it will solve a very important problem or help to solve it, a cross party group, whether it's whatever tag it's given. Um, but I do think the starting point is for the um, cabinet member to tell us what's happened and what are the problems in writing in time for the next corporate scrutiny committee or ideally in advance of it which yeah. is what we requested to be produced for today and it hasn't been you've just reminded me of something that council speak you know the list of questions you said you had written uh, that you were going to ask but you decided not to because you worried you wouldn't get answers uh, you referred to earlier. Would it be possible to provide the, those questions to democratic services? Because then we can ask for, for start asking responses. I'm sorry, that was just an aside. Okay. Was that the questions that I had prepared for this? Yeah, certainly. Uh, any more to add on the, the motion? Can I, can I, can I just suggest to Michael that we withdraw it and resubmit this at the next meeting if appropriate? Oh, I could. I, oops. <laughs> I think it's there is a relevant point, and I accept from Councillor Spink, right, and Councillor Robinson, that you've got to have a starting point. So any kind of task and finish group, right, which is um, yes, would need that, right, would need that um, particular starting point because you can't you can't be a critical friend and look at solutions 
unless you know where the particular point. And I, I would have absolute confidence that the cabinet member would supply that and actually work. I think one of the purposes is often of a task and finish group. Uh, and I'm a supporter of them because that's been a very successful way for me as a, as a, uh, a backbencher to actually get involved. Um, has been that you be able to to go in private session in those groups, perhaps get to more answers than you would do in in public. We do that through the health scrutiny quite often uh, in briefings, where we get far more out of something of the NHS than we do in a private session than we do in a public session. We can then publish the results in a in a in a in a, in a, in a public forum. So I, I'm, I feel that um, uh, I'm happy to withdraw my proposal at this point on the basis that we do look at setting something up so that we can actually be of, of uh, pra uh, practical use at the next time, but gives the cabinet member that opportunity to come back with those details. So. But I will then put the proposal of a task and finish group back on the table because I do think it's a useful vehicle. And and uh, just in your comments about the previous report, I am absolutely appalled that some of those ideas were not taken up by the previous administration, which were actually very practical ideas, um, you know, that could have actually put, put forward then. So I'm I. I would want to see a task and finish group get to grips and actually keep and, and put forward suggestions that actually do put things into into action uh, with, with, within that. But it's a, it is groups is a way of active backbenchers getting involved, uh, you know, with it because some of those, you know, Councillor Adams knows about the building trade probably more than anybody on. Uh, any of the councillors uh, here. I know um, a lot about poverty and housing over 40 years, particularly in mental health right across the UK. We have something to contribute. Thank you. I, I, I do agree. Councillor, did you want to make a point? And I'm going to do that end this. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and be brief. Uh, what concerns me, I think as a starting point, as Peter says, we, we must find a starting point. And I find it very frustrating. And getting back to what you spoke about earlier, Chris, with regards to developers and when the planning ac applications are coming in and they need some surety, I would like some surety, not only as a councillor, but as a member of the public that lives here, that when these permissions are granted, these developments are actually brought forward and delivered. Not like in the example of Penny Feathers, they're just stuck on hold. I don't think that benefits anyone. I don't know how we drive that change and bring that in, but I think we have an opportunity as a council and across this chamber, we need to look at that very, very seriously within the dips. If we need to delay the dips an extra couple of months to do that, I believe we need to do that. I think it's something we need proper discussion at across the chamber and we need a separate meeting to do that. This isn't the place. We could talk about it all night, but I'll I just believe it's something we need to try and address, address, and that's got to come from government. It's not something we can do as a council, but I think we need to get that out there because I've no doubt we're not the only, you know, we're not the only place in the country that have got these problems. It's it's nationwide, and we need at the same time as we're expected to give these planning applications consent. I think we need the people at the other end of the deal to deliver for us. Point. OK, I'll, I'll end it in terms of questions and statements there. I'll try and summarise uh, with some actions to take away is that we do need uh, to kind of spring to point um, a report on progress and future. I think that's very important because it would be nice to see what progress has been made so we can actually see what the trajectory is and what the future plans are. The word that's being used most by everybody is stuck. Everybody feels stuck. The process feels stuck. So unfortunately, Chief Executive, <laughs> I'm going to put a few things on your play is can can you take responsibility and I know you have to anyway because it's you're in charge is find out what is what is sticking the modular housing what's sticking the private uh, company 
and what's stopping is getting a spade in the ground on digging um, and, and come back to us. But I think the most important thing about this is this has been the most cohesive I think I've seen this committee, if not council so far, is that I will use this as a stick at the next meeting to beat all of us with, is the one agreement is that housing delivery and the numbers of houses built, as in more, has been agreed by everyone in this room. Now, I will remind everybody of that when we come to the island plan, because that is where the difference is going to be made. So thank you all for that, because that was a very, very, I think, honest and robust discussion, which is exactly what we're here for. Councillor, you better be very tiny. I hope that's what you meant. I just want to try and leave it on a positive, because I think it's really important that our residents hear a positive. And, and that is, is that my impressions, I drove around this island on a really big uh, tour this last weekend, using lots of petrol, sorry. Cameron. But I actually felt that I could see more movement in the housing market than I've seen in a long time. There are a lot of plots now being prepared for building. They're not necessarily the right kind of houses that we need because it's our rented uh, uh, market. But I do feel more optimistic that the, that the market is starting to move and that that will generate some more housing. And our administration has certainly spent a lot of time talking about uh, the current housing crisis. And we need to recognise that this is not just something that's happened. It's years of under developing, sorry, years of underachievement in providing the right kind of housing for, for our people. We've had years of that. It's not something that's just happened. So we've already passed the starting point and it looks more positive from my perspective because I can see more houses on the market becoming available for rent than in previous months. And that has to be positive and we need to give that kind of hope for our island people in moving forward. Excellent. Thank you. So moving on. Uh, to the last item, members' questions. Do we have any? Bear in mind, I think we've exhausted most topics this evening, except religion, and we won't start with that. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Spink. Yeah, I was going to ask a question because I thought Councillor Fuller was going to be here, but perhaps it could go on the work plan because he's not here. And that is, you may recall at the, not the last corporate scrutiny committee, but the one before, I asked Councillor Fuller, firstly, if he'd sought legal advice um, legal advice about the position um, if the council were to um, adopt a draft plan and then the um, national policy change, would we be bound by that draft plan? And Council Fuller has said that he had um, sought the le that legal advice already, but had yet to receive an answer. Well, that was two months ago. I've not heard whether he's received an answer. So could we have that advice, please? And the second point is, I also asked Councillor Fuller what progress had been made on his amended um, motion before full council that we should contact the other um, 52 local authorities in the tilted balance and see um, if we could lobby the government to take us out of the tilted balance pending the, the AR plan and be the um, um, change, potential changes in planning law. I've not heard anything about whether that's been progressed. So may may we have an answer? Bear in mind it was two months ago. Yeah, at the next meeting. That's please. fair enough. Yeah, that's a good one. Any other questions? Everyone wants to go home because it's still nice. I get that. Uh, if there's anything further, thank you all. Thank you for your contributions. And I do realise, you know, these are very motive topics, and I do look forward to working together because there's a lot of people out there that really are putting their faith in us doing that. So thanks again. Have a pleasant uh, evening. <laughs>